Good evening. Bonsoir. Tonight we celebrate the Writers' Trust's Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for political writing, named in honor of the well-loved parliamentarian who died far too young. The Writers' Trust was founded 40 years ago to champion and celebrate Canadian voices, the writers who tell our stories and help us see the world through Canadian eyes. Through grants and scholarships and our 10 National Literary Awards, we are proud to provide more financial support to Canadian writers than any non-government organization in the country. We could not do it without your passionate and generous support. So thank you. Rarely has there been a time when Canadian voices are so welcome. While we always aspire to be better, to the world we are a model for finding strength in our diversity. A country of East and West, North and South, First Nations peoples, French and English, immigrants from more than 200 ethnic groups. Seeing the world through others' eyes is who we are and who we aspire to be. And nowhere is this given more voice than in our political life. Our five nominees for political writing tonight include historians, journalists, and one of the most vibrant Inuit voices from Canada's North. Greg Donaghy is an historian who has written an insightful biography of one of Canada's most long-serving political figures, Paul Martin Sr., an ambitious Windsor boy, The Global View. Norman Hilmer is an historian who has opened the letters, diaries, and official papers of O.D. Skelton, one of the most influential public servants in 20th century Canada, and the architect of Canada's highly regarded diplomatic service. Well-known journalist John Ibbotson is nominated for his timely and much discussed biography of Prime Minister Stephen Harper, an intensely private man in a relentlessly public role. Andrew Nicky Forak toils in one of the most difficult roles for a writer, is a freelance investigative journalist who drills into the fracking controversy, a story still sending tremors through the halls of power. And finally, originally from Kujuak, one of Canada's best known Inuit activists who has represented Inuit voices at the regional, national, and international level, Shilawa Kutye is nominated tonight for her powerful and intimate memoir, The Right to Be Cold. On behalf of everyone at Writers Trust, congratulations to tonight's nominees champion of groundbreaking policy reform. In his accomplished political career, of which I am very proud, my father would lay the foundations of what many still consider to be the core elements of the Canadian identity. Greg Donahue's book not only captures the strengths and struggles of a politician dedicated to progressive social and foreign policies, it paints an intriguing picture of the political era in which my father lived. An era gone, but not forgotten in how it shaped Canada as we now know it. This is a book about the father of a prime minister. But while he was in politics, he wasn't known as the father of a prime minister. He wasn't even known as Paul Martin Sr. He was known as Paul Martin. Historian Greg Donaghy, in this deeply researched, vividly written book, he, he really captures the life and times of Paul Martin Sr. We see someone uh, of failed hopes, right? Someone who never became a uh, party leader, although he tried mightily someone who never became prime minister, although he wanted to badly. And yet when we look at the arc of his political career and the contributions that he made, we see someone who actually really did have an impact in the role that he played. I'm not afraid to be called a politician. That's what Paul Martin Sr. said, and I think it sums up his life. He was a career politician. Lots of people look at politics as a dirty word. And for Martin, politics is all about bringing together people in search of a solution that they can all live with. It's not always lofty or inspiring, but it's the kind of practical measure that makes, um, makes lives work. This particular biography recalibrates our understanding of who Paul Martin was and how important he was uh, to Canadian political history. The shy, dogged, and brilliant Dr. Odie Skelton was a dangerous man. As Under Secretary of State for External Affairs from 1925 to 1941, Skelton subtly and steadily shifted Canada's relationship with Great Britain. As the most influential public servant of his day, he was the power behind the politicians. Norman Hilmer deftly explores Skelton's life and services, warts and all, in a compelling narrative. This is an authoritative biography of a man who charted a new course for Canada. This book is about someone that you probably don't know. His name was Skelton. And the reason that we don't know a lot about Odie Skelton is that he was one of these transformers of Canada who worked from behind the scenes. Norman Hilmer 
is one of our finest historians in the country. He's written or edited 30 books, and he has spent the better part of his life working on this biography. I was intrigued that he was everywhere in the history of Canada, but nowhere. No one knew anything about him. They just knew that he was important, that he had this great impact. So often when we talk about people changing this country, they're elected officials, they're politicians. And this is a story of a bureaucrat who carved out this incredibly powerful role uh, for himself in this country. And he saw all kinds of signs that we were not just, we were not progressive, and we were not independent. And he set out to do something about it. And I think that Skelton was in many ways decades ahead of his time to be able to embark on making that happen, on being the architect of Canada's true independence as a nation. I think there are lessons to be learned from looking at the life and times of Odie Skelton. The many ways in which Canada changed during Stephen Harper's nearly 10 years in power have been documented, but the man himself has remained a bit of a mystery. With impressive access, John Ibbotson writes a remarkable biography that puts us inside Harper's head during some of the most critical moments of his life, from his decision to drop out of university, to his tumultuous relationship with Preston Manning, from his first date with Laureen, to his majority win. Harper is captured magnificently in this gripping read for all Canadians. Stephen Harper is hard to know. I think Canadians, even though he led this country for 10 years, uh, he remains a mystery. Without a doubt, Stephen Harper is going to be remembered as one of the most influential and important prime ministers that Canada has ever had. I think that this book is so important because it provides a fuller story of the road that Harper had to power. And that road began long before he was ever involved in politics. I had one hunch, which was that if I could figure out why Stephen Harper quit university after only two weeks and then didn't go back to university for three long years, if I could understand why he did that, I would understand a lot. He portrays Mr. Harper as an extraordinary, ordinary person. And I mean that in a very positive sense. If the reader closes the book and says, all right, I understand Stephen Harper now, I get him, then the book has done its job. They may not like him more, they might not like him less, but if they understand him, then I've written the book I wanted to write. Jessica Ernst, an oil patch consultant, lived a quiet life in rural Alberta until one day she realized that she could light her tap water on fire. A major Canadian oil company had fracked hundreds of gas wells near her home, contaminating the village's water supply. Told through the lens of his inspiring protagonist, Andrew Nikiforik's book explores the history of fracking, as well as the environmental and human toll that our society's obsession with oil has wrought. Slick Water is an impressive piece of investigative journalism and storytelling. What is so interesting about this book is that it starts with the history of the industry and how we got to a point where our economy is so reliant on oil, and it then shows the human side of this story. It's a story that will make you mad. It's a story that is utterly compelling. It's a story that Canadians should know about. If Jessica Ernst had not been a meticulous researcher that kept all of her documentation. Uh, if she hadn't done that, then the book wouldn't have been possible. This one person's journey also tells us that it's possible for single persons to become agents of change. And at the end, that's what I found the most compelling about this book. It answers questions, it also raises a lot of questions. And these are the types of things that Canadians need to be thinking about right now in 2016. I think if you give people the truth, However messy and dirty and offensive it might be, at least in the end you, you know what is truly going on and you can derive some comfort from that in the sense, okay, as a citizen, I now know that this is not working and as a citizen, I have a responsibility to change it. The Right to be Cold, one woman's story of protecting her culture, the Arctic and the whole planet. Sheila Watt Cloutier's international work on persistent organic pollutants, climate change, and other pressing environmental issues in the Arctic is an inspiration for Inuit and people around the world. 
In this intense and revealing memoir, Sheila explores the challenges and joys of her youth, the struggles to hold on to her culture during a period of rapid change, and how changes in the environment are threatening our Inuit way of life and our people. The Right to Be Cold shows how NGOs can make a difference and how Northern voices can be heard on global issues involving development and sustainability. Sheila Ayungi. I read this book in a beautiful sunny day in the fall and I was so absorbed in it that when I looked up and out the window I was kind of shocked that there weren't you know, mounds of snow and ice outside my window because I had been so brought in to her narrative of what it meant to grow up being cold. The Right to be Cold takes you off of your comfy couch where you're reading this book and puts you in Sheila's shoes as a child separated from her family, struggling to deal with what's happening to her community. I found it incredibly uh, upsetting and powerful. You know, I was propelled out into the international arena as an elected official for my people and got to have a bird's eye view of how the world works and how it ticks, how little it knows about the importance of Inuit culture and the importance of the Arctic's ice being the health barometer for the rest of the planet. The right to be cold is not just a right in the sense of uh, Inuit people's right for their traditional livelihoods, but it's actually a necessity for the survival of Canada and indeed for the planet itself. A Wat Kluche offers us deep insight into Inuit people and their culture and questions of the environment that are both specific to the North but have an impact on all Canadians. It isn't just about protecting the ice for the sake of the ice. It isn't just about the polar bears. It's about a people who are trying to make it. 